Okay, welcome everyone to another weird and wonderful Jazza meeting. Uh, although I guess by this time we should be used to guessing who's behind the face mask and uh, who it is that we're actually saying hello to. I'd like to say once again, as I did last time, a huge thank you to all of you for coming along today because you have ensured that every Jazza member will benefit uh, because there's no way that Walter would have been giving a talk to an empty room and a camera. Uh, so by coming today and being his audience, such a punishment for us all, isn't it? Uh, you have made sure that every member of Jazza has benefited. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce our wonderful, kind, accommodating, helpful Walter Mason. Walter and I once decided we really ought to be married to each other. Sorry, Tang. <laughs> we thought we were so well suited with our interests and our, you know, we both do a very similar sort of job in giving freelance talks and traveling around to different groups. So we've always had a huge amount in common. Walter is Vice President of the New South Wales Dickens Society. He is a much valued member of Jazza. He is an acclaimed author of uh, travel books and also articles and, and pieces on spirituality and, and different religions. And as I said, he is quite the nicest man in all of Sydney at the moment. And most of the time too, Walter. <laughs> So it gives me very great pleasure to welcome fabulous Walter Mason, who has such an interesting topic for us today with headaches, malingering and Mansfield Park. So would you please give Walter the very warm welcome that he deserves. Headaches, headaches, a very interesting thing in literature. Just make sure it's working fantastic. Now, as Sydney Austen scholar Father Michael Giffen points out in his book, Jane Austen's Religious Imagination, there was one great leveller in the world of Jane Austen. The fact that anybody could be carried off dead at almost any moment, most unexpectedly. It didn't matter where you fell in the, in the class strata. A rather horrible death was to be expected. If there are hypochondriacs in Jane Austen's books, there is a very good reason for it. Uh, because people tended to take ailments, even minor ones, much more seriously than we would now. People died very quickly from what, we, what might seem to us relatively unserious complaints. Things like cut fingers, toothaches, a cold. All these things were known to carry your loved ones off. And it's no surprise then that headaches were a thing that people worried about. Headaches pop up in Jane Austen's novels at several important occasions. Now I'm going to tell you that I'm not an objective speaker today. I suffer from headaches, so it's always interesting to me to read about them in fiction. Headaches are always inconvenient, they're rarely amusing, and they strangely seem to favour some people more than others. The mystery of the headache and its awkwardly invisible nature is something that naturally pops up in the novels of our beloved Jane. And though a headache is always a horrible thing and indicative of any number of deadly afflictions, it is not taken seriously in her books, uh, not at all. To doubt the headache seems to have been a literary and cultural trope of the time and, and now. As might be imagined, headache, as ubiquitous as it is in everyday life, also pops up with reasonable regularity in novels, though not perhaps as regular as they might occur in real life. And, and especially when you consider that the people record, writing down these novels are sort of uh, in a very headache-prone profession. All those hours spent hunched over a desk and uh, squinting as you write. It, it seems to me that, that, that writers are very, very headache prone. So I'm surprised that they don't appear more often in the novels. In the novels of the 18th century, the headache is seemingly a feminine failing. Now, I believe that in real life, uh, women do suffer headaches much more than men, but it's not by much. So it's. Uh, it's, it's, it's a 50 50 sort of proposition, proposition generally. But um, in, the, in the novels, particularly in the 18th century, and as they conti continue into the 19th century, uh, people are seen to use headaches to get out of sticky situations. 
and it is normally women who are recorded with this sort of duplicitous act. It, it provides evidence of the fact that those of rude good health are often suspicious of the headache and its reality. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at you. I know there is someone in this audience who, uh, who's, who, who's cast doubt on someone else's headache. Because, because the invisible nature of the headache lends itself to this sort of distrust. And um, in the novels, the headache is used to manipulate others, and partic particularly to avoid people, and particularly to avoid men. This is how the headache is used. It pops up in a, no in a novel that we know that Jane Austen read because she's included in the printed list of subscribers, and that is Fanny Burney's 1796 Camilla. In the novel, Eugenia, the rather accident-prone, kind sister to Camilla, uh, she retreats to her bed with headache to avoid the love letters of a horrid fortune hunter called Alfonso Bellamy. After Willoughby's abrupt departure, Marianne, in Sense and Sensibility, abandons herself to emotion and grief and cries all night without ceasing. Naturally enough, this brings on a terrible headache, and the next day she can't eat because of her affliction. Now, crying is known to bring on headaches, and the young Marianne is one of those unfortunates who seems to suffer this side effect of sorrow. Her headache, as the physical manifestation of her mental and emotional suffering, allows her to stay in her room and not have to engage emotionally with her mother and her sister. Marianne's headache, while almost certainly real, also serves as an excuse. She can stay away from sort of the, uh, the probing questions of people, no, no matter how well-meaning those might be. This is the motif of the headache not just in Jane Austen, but in much of English literature in the 19th century. It is a means of retreat, an excuse to be antisocial. The headache allows us time to be legitimately alone. Typhus was a terrible problem in the 19th century, and one of the first symptoms of typhus, apparently, is an excruciating headache. Uh, which cannot be relieved. So the whole time you're afflicted, you have this terrible, terrible pounding head. Typhus was also called the putrid fever. And in Sense and Sensibility, Marianne Dashwood comes down with it, the poor darling, causing the horrid Mr. Willoughby to come and inquire after her welfare. But fortunately, she recovers from this very grave illness. But one can only imagine the horrific he headaches she must have suffered all of this time. And had she been younger, it might very well have killed her, just as it did to most of the poor little girls at, at Lowood School in Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. In Pride and Prejudice, Jane is forced to ride on horseback to visit Carolyn Bingley. Mrs. Bennet has forced her to do it, uh, as um, the threatening weather might mean she has to stay overnight and be more in the company of Mr. Bingley. So it's, it's, it's a planned, it's a sort of a planned assault. Naturally enough, Jane catches cold and has had to send word of illness to her family. I find myself very unwell this morning, which I suppose is to be imputed to my getting wet through yesterday. My kind friends will not hear of my returning till I am better. They insist also on my seeing Mr. Jones. Therefore do not be alarmed if you should hear of his having been to me. And accepting a sore throat and headache, there is not much the matter with me. Yours, etc. Well, my dear, said Mr. Bennet, when Elizabeth had read the note aloud, if your daughter should have a dangerous fit of illness, if she should die, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. Oh, I'm not afraid of her dying. People do not die of little trifling colds. But of course they did. Suffering a cold in this period, Jane Bennet might have been made to drink hot elderberry wine by the hour until her symptoms decreased. I suspect that, you know, it was the constant consumption of elderberry wine that would cause the, a decline in the report of symptoms, anyhow. There were other ways to deal with the cold at the time. There's a fascinating recipe from a late 18th century cookbook, and, and I'm not sure if they'd laid in supplies of this at Netherfield, but here's the recipe. Take note. Take pearls, crab's eyes, red coral, white amber, burnt hartshorn, and oriental bezoar of each half an ounce. The black tips of crab's claws, three ounces, 
Make all into a paste with a jelly of vipers and roll into little balls, which are dry and keep for use. So forget the codrils. You've got an excellent home remedy on your hands. Although I'm not sure where we're going to get the jelly of vipers from. And now we come to Mansfield Park. In Mansfield Park, Fanny has this, this important headache. And um, she, it's because she's been spending time in the flower garden with her aunts. And Mrs. Norris decides she wants a supply of roses for her own room. So Fanny has to carry them there for her. And at the end of the day, she has a headache and Edmund is trying to discover its cause. Now, the perpetually enervated Lady Bertram must, we can safely assume, uh, suffered headache on occasion because she rarely leaves her couch and she's always complaining of being tired. Uh, her entire family take care not to vex her unnecessarily, saving her from all possible fatigue or exertion in every particular. So Lady Bert Bertram is sort of sickly and stays on her couch, though she likes her food, as we know. Um, but I'd like to drill a bit deeper into Fanny Price's uh, headache in Chapter 7 of Mansfield Park, as this is what gave me the idea for this talk. The uncomplaining Fanny, of course, would not dream of calling attention to her own physical discomfort, uh, but she's unable to conceal her, he her headache. She attempts instead to conceal her person. She moves to the other end of the room so people sort of forget her. She sits very quietly. And this manages to earn her a reprimand, of course, from Mrs Norris, but Edmund becomes concerned. Fanny, said Edmund, after looking at her attentively, I am sure you have the headache. She could not deny it, but said it was not very bad. I can hardly believe you, he replied. I know your looks too well. How long have you had it? Well, since the little before dinner, it is nothing but the heat. Did you go out in the heat? Go out? To be sure she did, said Mrs Norris. Would you have her stay within on such a fine day as this? Were not we all out? Even your mother was out today for above an hour. Yes, indeed, Edmund, added her ladyship, who had who'd been thoroughly awakened by Mrs Norris's sharp reprimand to Fanny. I was out uh, above an hour. I sat three quarters of an hour in the flower garden while Fanny cut the roses. And very pleasant it was, I assure you, but very hot. It was shady enough in the alcove, but I declare I quite dreaded the coming home again. Fanny has been cutting roses, has she? Yes, and I'm afraid they will be the last this year, poor thing. I found it hot enough, but they were so full blown that one could not wait. There was no help for it, certainly rejoined Mrs. Norris in a rather softened voice, but I question whether her headache might not be caught then, sister. There is nothing so likely to give it as standing and stooping in a hot sun, but I dare say it will be well tomorrow. Suppose you let her have your aromatic vinegar. I always forget to have mine filled. She has got it, said Lady Bertram. She has had it ever since she came back from your house the second time. What? cried Edmund. Has she been walking as well as cutting roses? Walking across the hot part to your house and doing it twice, ma'am? No wonder her head aches. So Fanny's headache is one of those rare cases in literature in which it is legitimate. Fanny would never engage in sub subterfuge. We know Fanny is, you know, per the perfect sort of person. But the fact of her headache, an undisputed fact, causes Edmund to act in an affectionate way towards her. Fanny's headache is due to her physical exertion. The results of having to take two long walks to and from the rose garden in the heat in order to please her aunt. Edmund observes that she has not the strength of other women and hence her nasty headache. He stumbles upon the rather alarming cure of bringing her a glass of Madeira, which in all likelihood would probably have made her headache worse. But in the 19th century, the sort of the curative powers of fortified wines were much believed in, unless you had gout, of course. <laughs> now we know what Jane Austen thought of the heat. What dreadful hot weather we have. It keeps one in a continual state of inelegance. We know this phrase because our darling Susanna Fortson says that every February, <laughs> when we all meet together in this hall and melt, uh, so it's a terrific quote, and really it's introduced that word inelegance to my vocabulary. I've used it 
very often to good effect in my career. It's a fabulous word. Now, as it happens, at the time that Austen was writing, sleeveless gowns were actually acceptable and were seen particularly at balls. And you like to imagine Fanny in a sleeveless gown to avoid the heat and the headaches, but I doubt very much she'd have been wearing one. Um, she would have been with something much more sensible, uh, a hand-me-down of some sort, and she would definitely have had her, her arms covered. Um, but um, it's well known that hot weather can trigger migraines, particularly in people unused to it. Now, though Fanny is used to exercise, she's not used to that sort of unusual hot weather in combination with exercise. In chapter 39 of Mansfield Park, the omnipotent third person author makes a very modern sort of reference to, to, to Dr. Johnson, she sort of addresses the reader. Um, this isn't actually the quote, this is just another fabulous quote. Uh, because it's not a real quote, it's sort of a reference. It's very funny. I'll, I'll, I'll get you to go home and read chapter 39. But this sent me to Dr. Johnson to see what he might say about headache. He made the very, very salient observation that those who do not feel pain seldom think that it is felt. But the rather, this bitter reflection was obviously born of personal experience because it turns out that Dr. Johnson himself suffered terribly from headaches, which sound very much like migraines. Uh, Boswell says that his most frequent ailment was the headache, which he used to relieve by inhaling the steam of coffee. Now, has anyone tried that one? I'm gonna try that. I haven't tried it yet, but I might try it later on this evening. Migraine had been identified in the continent about the mid 18th century, and it was definitely something that, that, that English physicians were aware of by Jane Austen's time. In fact, knowledge of migraine goes back to the um, 12th and 13th centuries in England, and there was a word for them, but it sort of slipped out of the lexicon and was revived by the very fashionable French and Swiss physicians who uh, were bringing new information. The migraine, or sick headache, as it was often called in the literature, was often viewed with suspicion. Uh, you know, it, it, a headache is viewed with suspicion, a sort of bad headache is viewed with even more suspicion. This is an image from a, a, a series of French engravings from the time, which became coloured paintings. Um, and it is simply called La Migraine. And you can see that the migraine sufferer, there she is over there, is really, the centre of attention. She's causing herself to be the centre of attention. And this was always the complaint about migraine sufferers, that everyone had to tiptoe around them. You've got the ser servant making sure the temperature's right. One servant has his shoes off so as not to make noise. They're hushing the child and preparing the bed. So the, the person suffering a headache is an annoyance. In Emma, Jane Fairfax is laid up with a headache after the departure of Frank Churchill. Going to visit Jane, Emma discovers her prostrate with headache. When they did meet, her composure was odious. She had been particularly unwell, however, suffering from headache to a degree which made her aunt declare that, had the ball taken place, she did not think Jane could have attended it, and it was charity to impute something, some of her unbecoming indifference to the languor of ill health. Now we know that Jane Fairfax is in fact overcome with emotion, at her secret lover's departure, but Emma assumes she is feigning a headache in order to avoid being forced into his company. And once again, we have that unfair suggestion made by people of rude good health, in this case, the occasionally insufferable Emma, that those struck down by headache are malingering and using the excuse of pain to avoid important social obligations. Emma sees Jane Fairfax's retreat, retreat into pain as the languor of ill health. So it's, a, it's an important word. It means tiredness or inactivity, especially when pleasurable. So this use of the word languor is, is, is imputing some, some, other, some other sort of gains. Um, and it's imputing that Miss Fairfax's headache might simply be an indulgence. And as always, an excuse for retreat from society. People are always suspicious of the headache. Around this time, people were attributing languor to the poor. It, it was you know, often mooted that the poor were simply too lazy to, to, to lift themselves out of a situation. And, the, and there's the possibility that Emma is engaging in a little bit of class commentary as well. 
because we know Miss Fairfax is of mysterious origins um, and is perhaps sort of uh, giving evidence of her sort of her blood inheritance by being lazy. Anne Elliot, in persuasion, is afflicted with headache. She had stayed at home under the mixed plea of a headache of her own and some return of indisposition in little Charles. She had thought only of avoiding Captain Wentworth. Now, this is the sort of thing that gives us headache sufferers a bad name. She doesn't actually have a headache. She's using it simply as an excuse. It's feigned head pain. Interestingly, it is only women who suffer from headaches in the novels of Jane Austen. So there's no men with a headache. Um, so it, this seems to be the idea in the period that women only are sufferers. A man, we must assume, would never uh, succumb to such a sort of subtle affliction. The thing that happens to men a lot in Austen novels is agitation. Now, agitation, we think, might, I think, might lead to a headache, but a man might be able to sort of head off head off a, a headache with a sort of hasty application of alcohol or a brisk ride or something like that. Um, but certainly agitation is, is sort of more, more manly than a headache. There's a famous state of agitation in persuasion when Wentworth writes his famous letter to Anne. The man is a mess by this stage, literally. He has papers scattered around, he's very messy, and he is described as being agitated. But in Emma, Harriet is described as becoming agitated when she discovers that Mr. Martin has left her a little letter of proposal. Now, Harriet is silly and unsophisticated and so easily led into this state of agitation, a state of being which is unbecoming in Jane Austen's novels. Mrs. Norris, too, in Mansfield Park, um, becomes agitated when she discovers that uh, Sir Thomas actually arrived in Antigua safely. She'd been preparing sort of uh, to uh, tell everyone that he died terribly at sea. And she was, she's, she's very disappointed when this proves not to be the case. And it said that she has to lay by her agitation. And the only thing that comforts her is that he may drown on the way back and she'll be able to, she'll be able to look out for everyone and uh, deliver the news. Snuff first came to the England in the 16th century, and it was advocated as a medicinal product, and it was used to treat headache and other conditions. Now, the Regency period was the last gasp for snuff. It was falling out of fashion, um, and it, yeah, it became really unfashionable after the death of George IV. It seems to have been a particularly repulsive habit and highly unlikely to have done much for headache. Um, snuff takers had a terrible habit of sneezing filthy brown goo um, sort of later on after they'd taken their snuff and this took its toll on their clothes and also their faces and hands. It was quite disgusting. Jane Austen disapproved of snuff taking. She wrote to her sister Cassandra after having visited some acquaintances in London and she says, I see nothing to dislike in them but their taking quantities of snuff. Another form of analgesia, which was becoming popular in Jane Austen's time, was um, nitrous oxide, commonly known as laughing gas. It was something new and uh, um, it was being experimented with. So the Cornish chemist Sir Humphrey Davy reported in 1800 that uh, nitrous oxide relieved a severe headache, obliterated a minor headache, and briefly quenched an aggravating toothache. So it's the beginning of using nitrous oxide. Um, nitrous oxide goes on to have a very long career in literature. Writers are often looking for something a little extra to inspire them. And, and nitrous oxide seems to have stepped in for a while there. One of its most famous exponents was um, William James, the brother of Henry James. He, uh, he, he was very keen about the use of no nitrous oxide, and he found the only way he could understand the writings of the philosopher Hegel was when he was high on nitrous oxide. And I don't know if any of you have attempted to engage with Hegel's philosophies, but that's, it, it might be just the thing, I've got to say. Um, uh, William James also happened to teach the great American poet Gertrude Stein. She, she was a medical student, and he was her teacher. So if you're familiar with Gertrude's poetry, you might suspect that she has indulged a little herself. 
And should you swoon onto a couch during the, during the Regency period, you might find yourself sniffing a small bottle of aromatic vinegar. Mrs. Norris, as we heard, she recommends that her sister offer her aromatic vinegar because purely by chance, Mrs. Norris hasn't refilled her bottle. Um, now these vinegars were kept by women on their person in their little bags or even as a, as a piece of jewelry. And uh, they were thought to be particularly effective in, in dealing what was called in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, megram, M-E-G-R-A-M, or the migraine. Um, or oh, the sick headache. And so the necessity of these vinaigrettes saw them become items of fashion. This is a beautiful French um, porcelain and um, gilt uh, vinaigrette. And um, they were absolutely ne necessary for migraines or for, for nausea or for anyone who felt, uh, who felt sick in any way. Marseille vinegar, also known as the Four Fees vinegar, was one such popular remedy. And it had been in use since the 15th century, where people said it was very effective in dealing with bubonic plague. Um, if you want that recipe, <laughs> rosemary, sage, lavender, camphor, cloves, and vinegar. So quite basic, but quite pungent. So these aromatic vinegars continue to be in use and continue to be com commercially available all the way through the 19th and 20th centuries. And as an aside, um, in the 70s, the company Clinique sort of devised a perfume that was inspired by these aromatic vinegars. It's called Aromatics Elixir. And it's quite unusual, and I happen to be wearing it today. So if any of you want to experience that 19th century feeling, I can organize a socially distant sniffing of my person and you'll be able to, to get a real feel for it. What I won't do to you is blister you. Blistering was the other great treatment for headaches at the time. Uh, One bought powdered dried blister beetles like these and you mix it up with vinegar and you applied it to the back of the neck of the person suffering from headache. Uh, this blistered the backs of their necks. I suspect it was just more painful than a headache so it took their, uh, it took their attention away from it. William Heberton was the great 18th century physician whose sort of advice continued on into the 19th century. He was a very influential and famous man. And he was quite advanced in kind of in recognizing that there wasn't much you could do for headaches. All he recommended was that people um, avoid noise, crowds, anxiety, and fatigue. And if the pain is particularly dire, he had observed that bleeding and vomiting could be helpful. But I think that's a bit of a cop-out because at the time bleeding and vomiting were prescribed for almost anything. So, um, But the other great headache cure of the time was laudanum. Uh, uh, this bottle, by the way, indicates that it was from the latter part of the 19th century because uh, it's uh, labelled poison. And in Jane Austen's time, it still wasn't uh, uh, considered or called a poison. So um, it, was, it was very effective and used very much. Jane was not unfamiliar with laudanum. Her sickly mother was a regular user. And in a letter she wrote, I had the dignity of dropping out my mother's laudanum last night. She doesn't, she doesn't sort of record how many drops they might be. But in the England of the early 19th century, opium was not the rare and dangerous thing that we, we consider it today. It was the main ingredient of laudanum and laudanum was the most commonly used medicine. Laudanum pills were being sold in London by as early as 1618, and the traditional recipe required opium, saffron, castor, ambergris, musk, and nutmeg. Doesn't that sound lovely? <laughs> it sounds like the ingredients of, of something delicious. The 17th century physician, and it is claimed alchemist Thomas Sydenham, he really popularised the use of laudanum during the London plague. Um, His other great success, you, using opium, you might, you might be interested in, was a cure for piles, which was a mixture of opium and frog spawn water. <laughs> what an ingenious mix. I don't know how he came about it. You'll be happy to note that it was applied externally. You didn't have to drink it. <laughs> Hogarth's etching, The Suicide of the Countess from 1745, depicts an empty bottle of laudanum at the foot of the suicided countess. So even in the 18th century, people were aware that you could kill yourself with, with laudanum, that it wasn't as very safe. I couldn't get, get too high a res, but there you see, there's the little bottle of laudanum that she's consumed. 
So it was seen as sort of a way out. It was inexpensive, it was readily available. All you had to do was visit the local sort of an apocryphal and the chemist and buy a bottle. And it has to be said, it was also a godsend. We have to remember that in the, in the late 18th, early 19th century, almost nothing could be cured. And everyone was basically in terrible pain from about the age of 20. So, so life was kind of miserable. And the only analgesics were opium and alcohol. So, so people really relied on this thing just to get by. And it was recommended for ailments as diverse as coughs, diarrhea, earache, and gout. There are no real statistics for opium use in the 19th century, but we do have a record of importation of opium, and it's, it's huge. So a lot of people were using opium all the time. If we briefly go back to the 18th century, to admire a lyric from William Cooper, one that Jane Austen almost certainly knew, as Cooper was her favourite poet. And he said, save me from the gaiety of those whose headaches nail them to a noonday bed. This was in a poem um, advocating the great importance of waking up early. So Cooper, Cooper thought that people with uh, headaches were lazy. They just, just wanted to lay, lay in bed till midday. He thought that get, getting up early would be all they needed to do. So I don't think he was, a, he was a sufferer of headaches himself. I do admire the cap that he's wearing, however, and I think it would be most wonderful for a headache sufferer to wear that. But in his case, it seems to be a sartorial choice. Looking very briefly at the 19th century novel, um, um, Sir Walter Scott's Waverley, he sort, of, he sort of is different from the rest of the novelists in that Waverley, the man, suffers from headache. But in a typically manly fashion, Waverley takes it way over the top. He's absolutely rigid with pain. He's described as shivering, violent headache and shooting pains in his limbs. So the servants don't even want to move him when he has a headache. So he's really going over the top. A bit of man flu, I think, is involved there. But Scott, as we know, was a, huge, was a big fan of Jane Austen. He said, what a pity such a gifted creature died so early. And in her turn, Austen was a fan of Sir Walter Scott, writing, Walter Scott has no business to write novels, especially good ones. It is not fair. He has fame and profit enough as a poet and should not be taking the bread out of other people's mouths. I do not like him and do not mean to like Waverley, if I can help it. But fear I must. <laughs> In Dickens' 1838 novel, Nicholas Nickleby, little Kate Nickleby, sent by her wicked uncle to work at Madame Mantellini's dress shop, feigns a headache in order not to come into work one day because oh, she's really sad and hopeless. I didn't know what to make of it, said Miss LaCreevy. Her eyes were decidedly red last night. She said she had a headache. Headaches don't occasion red eyes. She must have been crying. So here we have it again, again sort of doubting the headache sufferer and uh, the headache sufferer using the idea of the headache to avoid something else. In Mariah Edgeworth's 1801 novel, Belinda, another book we, we know Jane Austen read, the ruthless gambler, Mrs. Luttridge, uses headache in a duplicitous manner. Um, someone's playing against her that she admires and she knows she's going to win against him, so she feigns a headache to get out of gambling, uh, which is very nice of her. And a bit later, in Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South, its headache is used in an interesting way. Margaret Hale, who's been forced from the South to the North to work in a terrible factory, she suffers headaches. So headache seems to be um, associated with, uh, with, with the changes in society, with industrialization. This is, this is representative of all of the heartache that she has had to go through. Ultimately, the headache in Jane Austen, and then throughout the 19th century, serves three purposes. One, to demonstrate weakness, as in Fanny Price's case. Two, to demonstrate deception, or, as Mar Marianne does in Sense and Sensibility, concealment of something more serious, so the headache sufferer is lying in some way. And three, as due punishment for moral laxity, as in Cooper's verse we saw, um, and in this final example from Jane Austen's work, in Mansfield Park, once more, when the evil, sophisticated Miss Crawford pokes fun at the chapel in the stately home, not knowing that Edmund is going to become a, a clergyman, she says, 
If the good people who used to kneel and gape in that gallery could have foreseen that the time would have come when men and women might lie another 10 minutes in bed when they woke with a headache without danger of reprobation. So she's suggesting that, you know, you wake up with a headache. Who knows how you came by a headache that early in the morning, but I have my suspicions. And you might skip chapel and suffer a bit in bed, which is what Cooper talks about. So it seems that in Jane and in the 19th century, the wicked enjoy their headaches. They, they're either using them to get out of something or they're enjoying their, uh, they're enjoying their suffering and therefore they're languorous. The good, however, are up early and they're at prayer, just like uh, uh, the people that Cooper celebrates. You know, you don't, you don't linger on your suffering, but you, uh, you move ahead instead and, and, and live with it. Now, I don't know how many of you in this room today are headache sufferers. I'm not going to take a guess, and I won't ask for a show of hands. But I'm sure some of you are. Readers, I find, tend to be headache sufferers as well. Again, it's all that sort of squinting in the dark, you know, uh, when you're reading books when you should be doing other things. But the attentive, the studious, and the good won't be suffering headaches this afternoon. So I think I can see a few of you here as well. The headache is going to be with us uh, unless some miracle is sort of discovered to, to, to cure us all. And the headache will always be there in literature. But I hope that you are a little kinder when dealing with headache sufferers than the people in literature and even the people in our dear Jane's books. Thank you very much. And just to let you know, I'm doing a little thing. If you wanted to uh, spend some time with me without leaving your bedrooms, you can, in fact, do a Zoom workshop with me at uh, Mossman Library. What's, I'll be at Mossman Library, you'll be at home. So um, it is free, and uh, you just go onto their website to find the registration. Uh, questions? We're going to take some questions? Yes, we're happy to have questions, and I might start off for you. Please. Yes. How much do you think the headache suffering came in Jane Austen's day from eyesight issues, that they didn't have the right glasses? Because I know that's when I tend to get a headache is because, you know, you've left your glasses off or yeah. your glasses are not quite the right prescription or whatever it might be. And I guess, you know, optometry then was pretty basic. Yeah, I never thought of that, but absolutely that would have been one of the reasons, yeah. I mean, there's just so many reasons why people would have had headaches. Um, being shut up in rooms, you know, um, just alcohol consumption. You know, everyone drank, drank after midday, so there must have been a lot of hangovers the next day. Um, and just various ailments that people had, uh, which, which shot up to the head. It's, um, people were suffering. It's really sad to think about it, actually. <laughs> Yeah, but I never thought of the optometry now. That's absolutely important, yeah. And the other question I, I was thinking of when you showed that beautiful picture of the aromatic vinegar, mm. how did they actually use it? It wasn't a spray, was it? Did they just take the lid off and sniff? Yeah, it was... And put the lid back on again? In some of them that I've seen, it was like, it looked like a salt shaker, you know, there's a sort of a perforated top. And uh, inside was, the, I believe, was like a wick, like a soaked cotton ball. Um, which you put in your mixture, which you either made at home or which you bought. How did they take the opium and that the just the little drops? Back in back when it first came out, it was sold in um, in pills, in little round pills, just as they suggest for that cold uh, that cold um, uh, medication with Viper's Viper's jelly. But um, yeah. By the 19th century, it was normally served as, as, as a bottle. You went and bought a bottle of laudanum, and that's how Jane Austen was giving it to her mother, um, which I imagine made it all the more easy to take too much as well, like the poor Duchess has, and um, then, you know, slip into another, another world altogether. wine or water? Yes, yeah, to make it more palatable, yeah. If that's, if that's the final question, thank you all so very much. I hope I haven't given you a headache. <laughs> and I... Trust many lovely, clear heads in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you all for a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, I was a bit worried, being somewhat suggestive. People <laughs> talk about headaches, I might. Uh, okay. But no, I'm happy to say 
Yeah. All clear? All clear. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a bit of time, there's a bit of laudanum I'm talking in between now and now, too. But, um, um, so you, you, you mainly concentrate on the headaches, um, but it, yeah, there were a couple of other um, illnesses that one could maybe fake, maybe they were real. Um, people who have, in these days, who have chronic fatigue syndrome, uh -huh. the big battle is uh, people don't believe That's it, yes. that it exists. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder whether Lady Bertram was a sufferer yes, of uh, yes. chronic fatigue syndrome. And, whether it might have been genuine. Yeah, yeah. She just said the one baby number five. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, headaches is the, 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 one of the world's uh, greatest contraceptives, I think. <laughs> um, and then Marianne, well, probably the sprained ankle was genuine, but yes. um, that's again something that I think one could maybe a bit harder to find, but um, yes. it, it had some. Good consequences. Indeed. Um, and then the, uh, well fi finally the, uh, the talk about the vinaigrettes makes me think that maybe in the near future there's an opportunity for a market for uh, really sort of um, jeweled uh, containers for uh, sanitizers. Ah, yes. I mean, at the moment, these have been little plastic bottles. Yeah, hideous. And if you could just take something out, uh, and just, you know. Oh, yes. Excellent thank idea. You as well. yes. yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank you. Society. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.